Let's talk about uh, PR, the history of the future, and uh, a little bit of background on, on Dwayne. So he's uh, spent uh, over 10 years as a creative director in the gaming mobile app and print industries. He spent uh, five years at Intel as an R&D software engineer and a user experience lead. Uh, he has a unique talent of translating abstract creative concepts into actionable real world results. He's a founding member of the Idaho Virtual Reality Council, and uh, I'm sure he'll be giving a plug for, for that as well. He's currently the Senior VP of Game Development for Black Box VR, and he holds the world record for Unity Certification Fund. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So that's my LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. um, no, uh, my name is William Mathis. Uh, I'm fortunate to be a senior VP of game development at Black Box VR. And yeah, so I want to talk about VR as an emerging industry and how how you can be a part of it. Um, so can I get a show of hands who's like had a chance to try high-end green scale VR? Oh, oh high end. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like proper VR, the real thing. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so great. Well we brought a demo. So those of you who haven't had the opportunity. Better have your minds blown. I mean, it's it's awesome. Um, so when we think about VR, those of us who grew up in the '80s and grew up as children of pop culture, <laughs> like we have a lot of like notions about what VR is, right? We've got Johnny Mnemonic kind of like surfing this weird virtual geometric internet, and we've got the lawnmower man who's like this huge intelligence in the data sphere, um, and you know, and you know, we have dark corporations that rule the world. Not much different from today. Really. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I want to get across here is that like, as a culture, we've kind of been dreaming of what these technologies are going to bring to the world. And we're fortunate enough to like, not live in a dark, gritty, you know, abandoned casino. Uh, instead, you know, we live in Boise, you know, in like, city, exactly. you know, and we have all the benefits of these technologies. Um, and most importantly, like, I really believe, and this is you know, this is one man's opinion, but I, I really think that immersive technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, are the way of the future. They are going to enable the future of computing, education, and and social media and collaboration. So VR, it's I really think it's the future. Um, so I want to first go over a couple of terms so that we all are on the same page of what we're talking about. Um, virtual reality, I think we all kind of have an idea. Um, what that is. Uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, uh, there's a lot going on in the industry. So VR is talking about total immersion. So your sight, uh, your hearing, even your sense of touch uh, through haptics is completely immersed in the, in the simulation of whatever you're doing. Uh, we have the capability to, to check out a vast, infinite array of worlds and Environments, um, and this is this is where it's really mind blowing, right? Like just just the the diversity of experiences that you can have. Um, one of them, I mean, I can show you this one uh, later today. Uh, you know, you can be under the ocean, or you can be on Mars, or you, you know, it's it's really amazing. Uh, so, augmented reality is basically overlaying uh, relevant information uh, over top of you know the world you're looking at. So. Uh, this is Google Glass. I was fortunate enough to be part of the Explorer program for that. Um, it was really ahead of its time. I mean, both technologically and socially. <laughs> um, no, it was really neat. I mean, you could look at some things, and, uh, like I could look at um, you know, some text on the wall, and it would like translate it into Spanish or German or whatever. Um, but, like I said, technologically, like the battery would last like half an hour. And, and socially, you know, anytime I walked around with it on my head, um, people would just be like, are you recording me right now? What? No. Why would you wear that into a bathroom? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so the world really kind of wasn't ready for it. Also, it was three thousand um, dollars. But where I really see this coming together is mixed reality. So, and this is this is kind of the offering that Microsoft has really jumped on board with uh, with the Hololens. Um, and what the difference between this and augmented reality is that mixed reality reality allows you to interact with objects that are being projected into the real world. So like like this guy can interact with his like 
turbine thing, and you know, it's it's rendered stereoscopically based on the planes of the room. So you can like walk around it, look at it from different angles, that sort of thing, and and collaborate with other people who can see it you know, from from their own perspectives. Right. Um, similarly, like this, you know, you can kind of like interact with objects. <coughs> um, and another use of mixed reality is a two D video uh, over virtual reality content. So um, at Black Box and IVRC. Uh, one of the things that we do pretty often is we do, uh, you know, game and experience reviews of, of like VR apps. But it's super hard to communicate the immersiveness of VR on a flat screen, right? It's like it's like somebody sending you a postcard of you know the Eiffel Tower. It's not the same thing as the real Eiffel Tower. So what we try to do is we take um, we take like green screen video of the person, uh, what they're doing live as they play the game, and we like overlay it. Over uh, you know the screen capture of the, of the virtual experience, and it kind of gets there. It's it's not it's not one hundred percent. So this is this is a big thing, guys. Um, it's projected that you know immersive technologies, VR and AR, are going to be a seventy billion dollar industry by twenty twenty. That's that's only two years away. You know that's really <coughs> exciting, and it's and it's reminiscent of kind of like the dot com boom. Um, you know, back then people were like, "Oh, wow, I got to get a website." Everybody has a website. Now we're starting to see companies like try out our virtual experience. You know, most of the new movies are coming out with like, uh, you know, free VR experiences to kind of like buy me for the movie and things like that. So, so it's really starting to explode. Um, all of the major players are sort of involved. So, like, Facebook, uh, you know, has Oculus. Sony has PSVR. Microsoft has Hololens. Uh, HTC and Valve, uh, you know, have a Vive. Um, Samsung has a headset coming out that will go pretty soon. So it's exciting and it's being pushed by all of the big players in the industry. So um, it's going to be a big deal. Um, so it brings a lot of benefits and it also brings a lot of epic fails. So <laughs> just to communicate how immersive it is, I mean, that, I'm sure that guy is, you know, he's. He's just like one of us, like not a ninja, but not like super clumsy either. You just get so into it that you kind of like forget where you are. Um, even <laughs> so, I'm a professional in the industry, and this kind of thing has happened to me. Uh, I tried to put a real beer down on a virtual pool table. <laughs> it worked out about as you would expect. <laughs> um, and and I have another funny story about this. So this this experience is called the plank. And you, you ride an elevator up to like the millionth floor of this building over the city. You walk out on a plank, and it's really scary, and, and everyone laughs and, and whatever, and it really gets your heart pumping. So, but one of the fun things to do is tell people to jump off the plank. Right? And so uh, one of my coworkers, Chuck, like he was showing his mother-in-law about this, and she was really immersed in the experience. She's walking on the plank, and he's like, OK, now, now step off the plank. And she was so into it, she kind of forgot that, like, what was the floor? And so she just, like, Assassin's Creed trust me. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And, and that's really the power of it. Like, we can take over all of your senses. It's, it's awesome. Um, and more importantly, it's not just gaming. So, you know, I consider myself lucky to work in the game industry, but also uh, there's, there's so many more benefits uh, of these technologies. So education. Um, so imagine like being able to be in the human bloodstream or inside a cell or like you know in the Colosseum in Rome or on Enceladus and watching the ice guys or blow up. Um, it's it's amazing what what you will be able to deliver to people in context. So it's one thing to like you know read a book about something and see pictures of it or whatever, but to actually like be there and explore and see things moving around. Um, it's going to bring a whole new level of contextual understanding. Um, so hospitals. Uh, so this particular one, you're going to be glad that I have such a generic picture for it. Um, <laughs> Colby Labs. So Colby, Colby helped design this experience. And uh, basically, for training uh, people who work in hospitals and nurses and hospital staff and whatever, um, there's a lot of things that are cost prohibitive to teach. So the one about this is inserting a catheter. That's where I said you're <laughs> um, And I mean, this is a tender operation. You can't just like 
right? You have to like, <laughs> you need to learn how to do it the right way. And unfortunately, the only way to learn how to do that is on a cadaver. So they don't really have just like piles of cadavers for you to like practice inserting your catheter. Uh, and so it's one of these things that had kind of like a, a you know, not a great rate of success. And so uh, Colby and the students of the GIM program put together an experience that teaches people how to do it in VR. And you know, through studies, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they saw um, you know a, a pretty big uptick in success rate and uh, you know lower risk of infection and that kind of thing. So so it's it's really enabling for for training, um, fitness. This is what I do at Black Box VR, and we'll talk about that later. I, but you know, the core concept here is that like going to the gym is super boring. Um, it's and the reward that you get from it is very slowly delivered. So when you go to the gym and like, you know, you start, you, you know, you're, you're out of shape and you don't need to go to the gym, so you just go in there and you start working out. And you get up early and you, and, you, and you suffer through delayed onset muscle soreness and whatever. And you don't even start to see the change for like a month. <laughs> and so I, and that's a huge barrier of entry to people like going to the gym and getting healthy. So, you know, our offering is, you know, to sort of like offer quick uh, reward loops of, you know, video games Find that with experience, so you're working out, but you kind of just are having fun and playing games. Um, so sports training. Uh, there's a company called Striver that makes like a quarterback trainer, essentially, um, that is being used by the NFL, and it pretty much like puts the guy on the field so he can learn how to like pick targets effectively, like in the crush. You know, um, enterprise design and you know industrial design. So imagine like. But you have this in a car, and but you don't really get to see what it looks like in real life until you actually build it. You know, here we can demo it in VR, and you can you can get in the car and see what is what does the console look like? You know, how does it feel to sit in? Um, they can they can now like make models of what they're going to build and experience them in real life. Uh, in fact, at Black Box, uh, we did a very similar thing. You know, we have a big workout machine that we designed that's tracked in VR. Before we actually built the machine, we made a, like a VR experience in the room. We could see how big it is, and, and you know, we could interact with it and try to figure out like what interactions work or which ones don't work. Um, so, I apologize if you guys don't get the audio. I kind of hope you do for like later. But um, so, Google Earth. I mean, I, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Google Earth. Uh, now it's in VR, and you can go straight to the place that you want to go, like Rome, like, like anywhere. In fact, during the uh, during the eclipse recently, uh, you know, I was I was in the park and I was like looking at the looking at the eclipse and it was awesome. And then I went home and Google Earth actually had the eclipse in that same park. And now you can go right down the street to, and you can actually experience it from there. It's it's crazy. Um, I won't make this this whole video, but. But you can kind of see the benefit, right? Like it's 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 amazing. Um, so indoor positioning um, is a is a huge thing for uh, robotics and for you know for some of the work that I did at Intel. Um, before some of these technologies came out, indoor positioning was like you know ten centimeter accuracy, where now we have sub millimeter indoor positioning. So that means like you can move a teeny teeny bit and it will track and register and you'll be able to see. It. Um, and even outside of VR, this enables some some really interesting applications. Um, I have a friend uh, named Mike, who uh, is a good friend of mine. Uh, was a coworker of mine at Intel, and he has uh, a daughter who has severe cerebral palsy, and she the only thing she can move is her eyes, and so she you know she like lives her life in this wheelchair. And he designed this system using the um, HTC Vive Lighthouse technology. So that he can like create paths that her wheelchair can follow, and so she can just like she has a little screen in front of her, and she can like look, um, and you know, with an eye tracking system, she can look at icons that represent different rooms in the house, and it'll just drive her there. It'll do obstacle avoidance and, and all that kind of thing. So it's 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 really like helping people to live better lives, and even not not just you know through like I said video games or whatever, but but really like actual fundamental quality of life improvements. Um, so, how many of you guys have gone through the the joy of checking out houses in order to like buy a house? Um, it can suck. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> so, 
Um, but imagine if you could just check those houses out at home and you could filter out the ones you don't want and pick the one you do want, and then you would only have to go one time to buy that one. Yeah, yeah instead of like dragging the kids and, and you know, everyone, the kids are like, how about this one? No, you don't. Um, um, I also met a guy uh, at our last uh, Idaho Virtual Reality Council meeting who does architecture, and now he's building his buildings in VR first uh, before actually Um, and this, this is actually where I'm the most excited because I have a friend um, who's a co-worker of mine, he's our VP of data science, and he and I have to work together uh, you know, pretty much all day, uh, but he lives in Colorado. And it's really great to be able to just like hop on the headset and be in a room with him. And we can, we can draw like the previous video, right? We can draw in real time in, in 3D space. And so when we go and design our like algorithms that that track like exercise form and whatever. We need to do a lot of like linear algebra and stuff that's hard to communicate, uh, you know, when you're just looking at someone's screen and you're drawing a 2D image. It's way better to say like, well, this vector is here and I need to move through a plane over here and it goes like that, and, you know? So, um, and we have like a room, we have our own room, it's like this beach house and there's just algorithms designed everywhere like that I just save and they just are <coughs> where I want. And I can even do like, you guys have ever heard of like the memory palace idea of, uh, of like remembering lists and whatever? It's, it's a technique to help you remember lots of things. Um, I actually made a memory palace that I can walk through and look at like various algorithms that I need to remember on a daily basis. And then like I can I can make a mental formation of where those are in that space. So um, it's it's great. So okay, the technology. Um, so starting from the most Low barrier of entry, uh, Google Cardboard. Now, I remember when this was released at Google I.O. and I immediately got one. And I mean, it's basically a phone strapped to your face. So, you know, there are limitations, but for what it was, it's it is a low barrier of entry experience that people can be like, oh, I get it. So, essentially, it just puts it splits your screen into two stereoscopic images, and you have lenses inside the cardboard frame. And it uses the accelerometer inside the phone to like render the view of what you're looking at, um, and it's really not that bad. Um, a step up from that that Google is still, um, you know, is, is pushing kind of like this lower end is the Daydream. It's basically just a nicer form factor. Uh, this one has a uh, a controller that pairs with your phone, so you can like have yourself move around or whatever. But these ones are really like the the kind of first entry level um, VR experiences. So this is actually where I think uh, the technology is going to develop more and more. Um, there's not a lot of consumer <laughs> devices that have inside out yet, but the idea here is that, as you can see, there's, um, there's like stereoscopic cameras on the front of the headset. And it, you know, just like your eyes, it can, it can judge distances and sizes of things. Kind of like, um, I don't know if you guys saw the recent uh, Apple keynote where they were talking about the new iPhones and how um, you know, their stereoscopic camera can project knows that this plane is like this, whatever. So that's essentially what it does, and it maps um, a boundary for you to like, walk around in the space and not bump into things, and it can render, um, you know, like that, that turbine picture we saw earlier, like in the space in the, in the right place. Now there's, there's certain limitations. Um, so like these controllers are captured by those cameras, and so if you move out here or behind your back, it doesn't really know where you're at. That's particularly limiting for us uh, when we're doing fitness because a lot of the exercises are like, you know, your arms are not within your visual range. Um, so that's why we use Outside In. Um, and that's pretty much the two major uh, VR platforms today. So Oculus Rift, um, they, they work very similarly. Uh, you can see how on the controllers they sort of have these little, little uh, infrared lights. And Oculus, you have like little cameras that you put uh, in the corners of your room, and it picks up on those lights, and then you can see they're uh, distributed asymmetrically around, uh, you know, on, on the headset and, and around the controller. So it can it can calculate exactly how that thing is positioned and rotated in space. Um, and HTC Vive, uh, so this is the one that we use at Black Box, and the one that I have the most experience with. Um, all of these dimples that are like on on the headset and on the controller are photodiodes. And you have base stations like this that have um, they have two uh, 
lasers that sweep across the room on X and Y. And as those things pass across those photodiodes, the headset itself can calculate where it is, how it's moving within the space, and its, and its rotation. Um, and it actually anticipates future movement, and so that allows it to like build a frame buffer, so you, you know, um, so you can maintain a smooth frame rate while you're in there. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, how do we like start working in this industry? Uh, one of the things that is interesting and a is that aside from a few people at NASA, like nobody started working uh, in VR. It's it's an industry. It's, it's it, you know all of us are coming to it from different different places. You know we all have different stories and different things that we have to the table. That's what's really exciting about it. You know at our office we have uh, we have a guy named Chuck who uh, used to be a dentist. You know now he's just <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing uh, that there's, there's huge opportunities there. But what I would say, uh, if you're interested in getting into the industry, is, you know, the, the romanticism of being a renaissance man. Right? But really, there's happening that it's, in my opinion, it's almost impossible to focus on only one thing. Uh, with a job, I get called upon to do all sorts of weird things. Um, you know, I do uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, Electrical engineering, reading modeling, all this stuff, which is not always in my wheelhouse. Public speaking, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, not exactly my cup of tea. But but the idea is be be open to new experiences. If, if an opportunity opens up, go for it. Uh, so I want to talk about how I got into the VR industry and kind of like how some of my experiences shaped what I do now. And it's. It's not really as much about me as much as it's about you guys thinking about how how can you get there? What are what are your stories and what are the offerings that you um, bring to the table? So my story follows a very circuitous route, uh, and <laughs> and I think that you can try to imagine how yours will fit into the picture. Um, I spent ten years in Asia. I started off as an English teacher in Taiwan. Um, I did. Four years of Mandarin at university in in a little town called, um, and once I started to learn how to, you know, communicate and became more fluent and whatever, I became a game designer. Uh, a tiny company in Taichung called Spin Interactive, uh, and I eventually went on to co-found a branding and design firm. Uh, we, we were focused on bringing Western design ideals to Taiwanese OEMs who were, you know, trying to market. Uh, their products to America and Europe. Um, it was exciting. It was interesting. Um, I, you know, ten years. I eventually needed to change them, and so I went to Australia on a whim to join a band. And <laughs> ended up uh, the band thing didn't really work out. So I got the first job that I could. Uh, it was a kill table. I made a hundred dollars a week, which to me is not a lot for Australia. Um, <laughs> but but well, I actually learned something from this experience. It wasn't. It really wasn't that bad. It was cool. I met a lot of great people, and I also learned that when you have to hand sew thirty-five feet of Scottish wool, like you, you learn to like knuckle down and just like you know be determined and get it done. <laughs> so when I had the opportunity to bail from that career path, uh, <laughs> so I took it. Uh, a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to uh, start a game design studio in Jakarta. Let's do it. So I took off to Jakarta, and it was not exactly like this. Uh, actually, it was more like this. <laughs> um, I spent most of my time heads down, um, learning to write code, you know, you know, not very well designed video games, and trying to keep my internet access running and that kind of thing. Um, but what I learned from that experience is how to pitch ideas to publishers. Uh, we did a lot of that. Um, how to get, you know, how to get games from like the to actually built and working, um, user testing, a lot of things like that. Um, so I ended up getting married in Indonesia, and when it was time to like have a family, I thought, okay, it's finally time to stop this crazy trek around the world, come back, and you know, have a family. And so uh, I wanted my kids to grow up like I grew up in Alaska, um, but I didn't know what I was going to do. 
Um, the game design thing really didn't end up making any money for us uh, in Indonesia, so I didn't really have a lot of money. I came back. The first thing when I literally opened a newspaper, and the first thing was game developer wanted, and so I tried out for that, and you know, I fortunately I got the job. Turns out there weren't many game developers in Alaska <laughs> at that time, and. Um, and I worked my way up uh, to project manager and eventually creative director. And we we were fortunate enough to publish some pretty awesome titles. Uh, I don't really remember this. This was kind of in the early days of an iPhone. But we made the Trenches franchise, Trenches 2, Gibbs and Glory. So there was some some cool things. Work for EA and things like that. So, um, But as most contracting work goes, it wasn't always work. So uh, when I got headhunted by Intel, I took it. And so I moved to Arizona and uh, became a UX lead and a R&D software engineer, which is not as exciting as it sounds. Um, the things that we worked on were pretty boring. Um, they were kind of like back end, driver, no, no, oh, that's Chris. <laughs> I mean, we, were, we were connecting to, uh, you know, just Intel specific hardware on the motherboards that Windows 10 had blocked off and things like that. And, and, the most exciting thing in the world. Um, so I had all this creativity that was just like exploding out of my body that I couldn't really use in my job. So I started building um, in my spare time at home. Um, and this was my first one um, that I designed and sort of came up with. And I learned everything about you know programming Arduinos to you know uh, how all of this stuff works. And, and people really like took a liking to it. They posted you know my videos of that robot on their main Facebook page, um, given access to an industrial uh, and robotics lab, industrial automation and robotics lab uh, that was in my building. Got some friends over there and they were like, yeah, just come in and help out, you know, that'd be great. So that was awesome for me. So I got, you know, teaching my boy about robotics at that time, you know, and, uh, um, and I got, like I said, it was huge for me. I got a free pass to give me a door code to come in to the robot lab and just play with stuff. Um, and I helped out with every project that I possibly could. Um, I did my normal day, and then in the late afternoon and evening and early in the morning, I would spend all my time in the lab building stuff. And we did lots of projects, and eventually to help design a, a, uh, a new robot to help show our um, Bradshaw City platform. Now, I hope there's sound for this, because um, this robot plays an instrument. Uh, Oh, what? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Please tell me the answer. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So before this really gets rolling, um, they first asked me to build uh, a robot that would play the violin, which you know there's a lot of technicality to playing violin that we did not have. Power or the budget for, and so I started to think of like, what would be, what's an instrument that would be easy to build a robot that would be able to uh, calibrate uh, on the fly? And so I thought of um, the Hujang, which is a it's a Chinese zither. Well, I'll let this kind of speak for itself. So uh, the first 
we brought that to uh, was the Chinese International Industrial Fair, which is kind of like the CES of Asia, and we won the gold award for it, which I'm really proud of. And we ended up taking it to like 60 or 70 trade shows all around the world. Uh, I didn't go to hardly any of them. But, uh, and we also got asked um, by the government to let us uh, retire that robot in the Shanghai National Museum. So that's pretty sweet. Uh, it, so one of the one of the issues that we came across when we ran that thing is that every time we put it in a box um, and ship it to a new trade show and then put it all back together again, and the way that that was recalibrating it so that those fingers will reach exactly to each string every time the same way it was really really tricky and so um, I ended up um, kind of inheriting that whole thing as like my own project and I rewrote the entire system loop. How it's been created in ladder logic, which is disgusting. I don't know if any of you guys have worked with it, but it's yeah. <laughs> not my favorite. <laughs> um, actually, so I actually work with some of that today. And so the, the point of like showing this is that like things that control those sort of industrial robots and whatever are actually controlling VR too. Um, and because of my success with that project, I ended up getting promoted to lab manager. So robot lab for a couple of years. Pretty cool. We worked on some really awesome projects. And the last one that I want to talk about really quick, um, because it's, stay with me, it's relevant, um, is uh, a passive RFID distance tracker. So uh, he, uh, it was for the Intel retail vertical. And I don't know if you guys know exactly how RFID works. Well, the passive tags, they're basically just a sticker with a little metal antenna in it that resonates uh, and can send back or something like a tiny amount of data um, but of course it doesn't know its position it's not powered so it doesn't have a lot of oomph to kind of like break through all the EVM that's in the room uh, so we created a system where the antennas could could like ping the the uh, little transponder sticker and you could like we would know how like the speed of the EM waves size and when we got back we would just get a delta theta on the sine curve like of, we wouldn't know how many waves had passed because these are like 550 millimeters, not this long. So we wouldn't be able to know exactly how many waves had passed, but we would know the delta of uh, the last incoming wave after the reflection. And so through triangulation with multiple antennas, we were able to you know, pretty, make a pretty accurate where those things were. Um, uh, but this, this isn't our real data, but it's pretty close. Uh, we would get a point like a whole bunch of scans. We could run like you know 100 scans a second, and it'd be like boom. We have all of this, you know, scatter plot, um, and most of it was garbage. I mean, you wouldn't believe it, but there's waves going everywhere. And <laughs> it's you know every room is full of them. So we, this would represent closer to what we the data we got from an anechoic chamber where there was no no other waves present. Um, and it, we use standard deviation to kind of like figure out which one of those. Uh, were you know, more or less correct and which were good data and then we were able to plumb. So how does all that lead to me? Well, as I was like doing the lab management thing at Intel, uh, there was a huge massive layoff of 14,000 people, uh, multiple verticals of Intel cut completely off out of the company. And I kind of like knew that that was coming down the road, so I was kind of you know looking for new opportunities and that's when I buy a pre-order game, and I got it a couple months before anybody else. And I tried, I tried it, and I was like, "Wow, this, this is the future. This is the technology is amazing." And it, and it reminded me of all of these like great, crazy transhumanist future about since I was a kid. And I was like, "And I have to be a part of this." So I started working on um, on a project. Uh, just immediately, I'm, I'm all about working on projects in my spare time. So the, I started coding for it. And I made a thing called Adventurer's Table. Um, I hope that music isn't too loud. It's really not that important. But the point is, um, I started to learn about uh, the software and in its infancy and like how to interact with things in VR. Um, the idea here was to kind of create a room where multiple people could like play role playing games together and they could like roll dice and, and uh, you could change the environment on the fly. So your, your game master could be like, now the party moves into a forest. Boom! All of a sudden, you're in a forest, 
but your table and all and everything that you got, like your sheets and maps and all that, are still in the same place. Um, so the key of this is that I was learning the basic interactions and what works in VR and what doesn't. Um, I quickly found out that like interacting with real, you know, real <laughs> physical analogs like picking up the clipboard or um, or like actually holding the dice made a lot more sense than like trying to push buttons and interact with menus. Um, it's it's weird because you're so transported with you want to like use your body and um, and interact with things in a natural way. And I was demoing constantly. So at that time, Vive was not on the market, so almost nobody had tried it. And it was, it's it's like super mind-blowing for people to try it the first time. So it was really exciting to like run people through it. And I found like one of the biggest joys of my job even today is just to let people try it for the first time and like watch their face and be like, whoa. So now, this gave me the experience though, so that when I got, um, uh, so I found out about the opportunity at Blackbox and and you know the just the opportunity to work in VR as a career uh, I'm all over it so you know they, they flew me over to Boise and kind of wooed me and brought me some like nice dinners and things like that and uh, nice yeah <laughs> well Ryan can do that kind of thing um, <laughs> uh, so uh, so yeah so I jumped on it and so a little bit about what we do um, were founded by Ryan DeLuca, who, when he was 17, he started a company in his garage called Bodybuilding.com, uh, and in the next couple of decades, grew that to $500 million a year in revenue. Uh, and he recently sold out of it, uh, but you know we are generously privately funded by him, um, and we're creating the world's first virtual reality gym experience. So, as I was saying, with the fitness uh, like aspect of VR. We found all sorts of really interesting things that like happen um, when you work out in VR. Number one, time dilation. Um, I, I've certainly seen not just in our in our experiences, but just in general, when people use VR, they have no idea how much time has passed. Um, and so imagine like you go and you play a game and you feel like you've been in there ten minutes and you really got like a forty minute workout, and you have a, a kind of a, sort of a loss of proprioception too. So you you don't really feel as much pain as you would working out. Um, you can just play and play and play, and there's all sorts of stories online about people who have just who have lost tons of weight all of a sudden just by playing video games in VR because they're doing this, fighting, sword fighting, and shooting guns and whatever, and then all of a sudden they're like, man, that was a real workout the next day. They're like, oh. <laughs> um, so we have a patent pending um, virtual reality resistance machine that can deliver all of the all of the things that you could get in a normal gym, but it's tracked in VR, so I can make it look like. You know, a siege engine, or like a fireball shooter, or you know, a spaceship, or all sorts of different things that you can interact with. Um, so you don't really feel like you're working out. Um, and as I said before, we we kind of use compulsion loops for video games to sort of like reward you all the time. Like, oh, you got to level up, great job. Um, and so you feel like you're leveling up, even, you know, before you actually start to see physical changes uh, in your body. So this is the machine. Um, it's not the most beautiful thing in the world yet, but it doesn't matter because you're seeing it in VR. And you're not even really seeing it in VR, you're seeing for the most part the spaceship or something. Um, so it's fully tracked, and what that means is, uh, I don't know if you can see like right here, uh, this is a live tracker, and it's one of the benefits of outside-in technology, is that um, we can take that tracker, and uh, the Lighthouse system knows where it is, so I can use the position of that to plot the rest of the machine in space. And so you can actually just like walk up to the machine, even though you can't see, um, you're not seeing the real world, you're only seeing a virtual representation. And you can walk up and you can like grab the handles and you can touch the back pad and everything. Um, I created a API in C Sharp for communicating uh, between our game engine Unity and the PLC. So I can tell the machine how to transform that, that back pad, like extends, the handles move up and down. I can change the weight in real time um, so that you know, maybe if you want to do something like uh, like a drop set, where every single one you do, like you know, uh, the weight climbs down very slowly. So maybe like if you go and do uh, like a hard workout, you go and do 12 reps of you know 200 pound bench press or whatever, and then that's all you got. But with this, I can make it like 199, 195, you know, 190, and, and I can get more out of you. 
that way and give you a better workout. Um, and also the idea of, of dumb handles, what we call it. Uh, they're not actually tracked in VR, but the, I know where they return to, so I can put them in the virtual space, and when you're holding them, you know, you're, you're holding the handle like this, and so I can draw how those cables go back to the machine because you always hold it the same way. The rotation of your hand is the rotation of the handle. Uh, so to get into a little bit of what I do, uh, one of our key challenges is form tracking. It's, we want to make sure that you're not going to injure yourself. So if I want you to do a bench press, I want you to do this. Um, I don't want you to do this or, or this. This is a different thing. Or who knows what other wacky thing. You know, we've seen people do all sorts of weird things in, uh, in our user test. So I started out with like hand place colliders. And that's like, you know, in game engines, you have the idea of colliders, which are just like boundaries of space that when you go into them, we know that you, you know, there's a pool that gets triggered. Um, and I just drew the exercise essentially with these colliders in space. And it worked pretty OK. That was, that was the first attempt. You could move through them, and it was good. But I quickly realized that like our two founders, Ryan and Preston, are very different in the way they move their body. And so Ryan, um, and you don't really know by looking at him, but when it comes to like computer vision, he's like a T-Rex. He's like, he's burly, but he has like little tiny arms. And so his <laughs> arm extension was like 60% of what Preston's was. He has really big arms. So the idea of just like drawing these things by hand wasn't going to work, because we're going to have to scale it um, to the people the right way. Uh, so I started to think of a more extensible system, uh, which led me to the idea of a voxel matrix. Uh, so um, if you guys don't know what voxel is, it's kind of like Minecraft. It's a 3D pixel. Um, and I, and I, I first made one that's like 10, you know, roughly 10 centimeter virtual voxel that you can move through. And they would track as you move the controllers through them. It would like, boop, 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 and I could like track the paths that you moved in VR. And it was neat. Uh, it was kind of like an EDM experience a little bit. <laughs> um, but again, like it didn't give me the accuracy that I really needed. Um, and there were also problems with how the colliders moved through multiple voxels simultaneously. Um, and what I realized is that because I'm snapping a, a time slice at each time I move through one of those voxels, uh, essentially each voxel was a time slice. And so I just, uh, the next version I made was um, it just takes a snap of where uh, the hand position and rotation and the HMD position and rotation every 100 milliseconds. So that was pretty neat. It, it worked really well. So I could, I could like make a visualization of exactly how you move. And I could draw paths and you could follow them or whatever. But what I found is that it was super punishing. <laughs> because I could scale it to your body size. Uh, so it would work for Ryan with short arms and Preston with long arms. But the movement patterns of like when you think you're just moving in a straight line, like I, I pretty much feel like I'm moving in a straight line by doing this. But when it comes to actually recording that movement, it was nothing like that. It was like a way like weird you know, curved line. And everybody was different. And so we ended up like, I realized as I made this was that the point cloud that we came up with was exactly the same as our RFID project, where we could just use standard deviation to figure out all these scattered points of all of our snaps and you know, give you, let's say, OK, if you're within two standard deviations, you are doing good form. And if you're not, then you're not. Um, but the problem was it was super punishing. Like I said, like if I move my arms like this and you do the same thing, you're not doing and so we ended up with these like really wide standard deviation, basically tubes that you had to move through um, that would be in order to let people actually succeed at the exercise. So that brought us to like movement regions with constraints. Um, one of the things with the recorded movements is we accumulated a massive amount of data, and then we had to like crunch it to make these these lines that we were supposed to move through, and then we had to evaluate it in real time. So you know, I mean, it wasn't. It didn't like destroy my computer or anything, but it was way too much work. Uh, and so now we can just make a, a region that you move through. Um, and that works pretty well. We know the rotation of your hand. We know the region you're supposed to move in, what's acceptable and what isn't. Um, the only thing is it's really hard to communicate that to the user. So um, that's where our like user experience comes in. Um, our you know, first and you know, current attempt is like these these virtual rails that kind of like sort of simulate the movement that you're supposed to do. So if you imagine you're going to do a chest press, you've got like these, these big rails that you just move through like that, right? It makes sense to me, but uh, 
non-engineers were not able to grasp that at all. And we had users come in and try it and just do the weirdest things. And like, I realized that like, experiencing VR is super overwhelming. And it's such a cognitive load to just be in a whole new world that they just didn't have the processing power to also understand that you're supposed to do this exact thing. So we're still working on the user experience. It's a real challenge. Um, so what's next for us? Uh, we're going to open a user testing gym early next year. Hopefully by the end of next year, uh, of 2018, we'll have actual individual gyms uh, in the idea is New York, uh, LA. Uh, we'll have one here. So that'll be pretty awesome. Um, and then we're going to have franchising and eventually hopefully get to the point where we have home units and everybody <coughs> is working in this multiplayer environment. Um, so if you are interested in working in VR, uh, after all of that madness that I just went through and all of that, think about what kind of weird experiences you have that you can bring to, bring to the table. Um, the opportunities really are endless. I mean, there's, there's huge investment going into VR right now. Um, there's, there's a lot of places that are looking for VR devs. And I mean, you, you don't even have to be in video games or software engineering. There's, there's tons of roles that are available. Um, like marketing, or creative direction, or biz dev, or you know, mechanical engineering. Uh, my my friend Nick, who I work with to create all of the movement algorithms, uh, his degree is in fluid dynamics uh, and like environmental engineering and like water flows and things like that. So he's really heavy on the math side, and that's super useful for us. Uh, like I said, we crunch an enormous amount of data, and I'm sure all of the, the other VR experiences do a similar thing. So you know. You have uh, you know skills in data science that's super useful. Um, uh, speaking of biz dev, our guy Chuck uh, that I mentioned before, he was a dentist, and when we started Black Box VR, he was so excited to just be a part of that industry that like after he was done with his day job, he would just come to our office and be like, "Hey, I'm getting a coffee. Do you guys want coffee?" Or he would like just, "Oh, you need a vibe set up over there? Let me do it." No. No, like no one even asked him to show up. He was just there helping all the time. And it was a lot like me at Intel in the robot lab. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. It was just like, sure, let's do it. Like, I'll help. Uh, you want me to start those things? Yeah, let's go. Um, so the idea is just like be, be a part of it. Now he's our VP of biz dev. You know? um, and so he educated himself on the fly and, and made it work. And, and those, so like I said, be willing to jump in and help out and, and have an open mind. I mean. This industry is just getting started. It's it's like, like I said, it's the beginning of the dot com boom, and it's going to take off like crazy. So, you can make your own opportunity. Uh, investment is huge right now. Um, the guys who developed Big Screen, uh, it's like a virtual screen sharing program. They just got eleven million from I think Microsoft. Uh, you know, obviously, Oculus was a two trillion dollar investment. Uh, small companies and startups are getting invested all over the place. Um, and the easiest thing you can do is start learning and start developing. Um, you can pick up a buy for less than 600 bucks. Oculus is like 400. Uh, and Unity is free, so you can get that. There's tons of learning resources out there online. Um, and SteamVR makes a plugin that's really, really easy to use. You just drag and drop it into your Unity scene, and it'll just sync up with your vibe, and you'll be able to see what you make in VR. And really, you can even download free environments and characters and whatever else from the asset store and chuck them into your project and you can just start playing with it. I mean that's that's exactly how I got started and I think it's a, I think it's an awesome path. Like I said, nobody yet has a whole lot of experience in this industry. Um, if you if you even work on one little VR project, your life is ahead of almost anyone else. Um, and and we're all learning as we go. So you know we're pioneering this. Um, and the world needs more pioneers. So, you know, get in and be a part of it. Um, we have the Idaho Virtual Reality Council uh, here in Boise. <laughs> and we do a lot of events uh, dedicated to introducing people to VR, to getting companies that are working in VR into the right opportunities, and you know, accelerating companies that are creating VR uh, experiences in Idaho. Uh, we just threw the VR bash uh, on October 5th. In fact, we even have Idaho Virtual Reality Day, which was made by the mayor. Uh, it's October 5th, so <laughs> it's pretty awesome to have our own day now. Um, we, we have a biannual 
uh, Inversathon. So essentially that's like a hackathon. You, know, you and your team have like 24 hours to come up with the craziest VR thing that you can imagine. And we have, you know, uh, the IBRC does some pretty cool prizes. I mean, there's like the obligatory like big <coughs> or computer stuff, but there's also like last year the winners got to come with me and Ryan to GDC and, you know, experience the craziness that is the biggest game developer conference in the world. So, and if you're not from around here, you can start your own group. I'm sure like in the US communities and cities, there's stuff going on. Um, you can even con uh, contribute to an open source project. Uh, I'm going to be open sourcing the adventurer's table pretty soon because uh, I just want to see where it goes. So, maybe even that. Um, so opportunities are out there. Uh, and there really will never be a better time to get involved. Like I said, this, this is the ground floor. It's like Bitcoin in 2011, right? It's like, get in there. Now's, now's the time. Um, be curious. Uh, be open to opportunities uh, that you see. Be proactive and, and, and just, just start networking. Start meeting people. Start getting involved. Do the dangerous. So um, I want to finish up with my favorite quote. Um, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what ships are for. So thanks for letting me blather about something I'm really passionate about. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, sure. You heard much about Magic Leap or anything like that? So, um, <laughs> has anyone heard much about Magic Leap? Um, so, I, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of familiar. I'm assuming they're making a mixed reality experience. They're kind of like promotional videos look like that. Um, they've had over a billion dollar investment into a project that they have never, ever shown a demo of, ever. Only promotional videos. So, it's kind of like a huge secret. I can't wait to see what it is. I think it's going to disrupt things. At least I hope it does. It doesn't like fizzle and be abandoned there or something. But no, I, I don't know anything else but more than anyone about it. Yeah. Um, what about the vertical aspect of VR world? I heard something like 25% of people that get going to the merge get a serious vertigo. Oh, um, I think, uh, my personal experience is that um, that is highly experience dependent. Okay. So one of the things that we really, uh, we're really careful about that in, in uh, black box, especially because you're working out already and maybe you're like, like you know, on the edge of getting a little sick because you're lifting heavy weights. Right. Um, one thing is not to have uh, artificial locomotion. So there's some experiences, like one of the first ones that people tried for Google Cardboard is like a roller coaster. And you put it on, and you're like, what? and you really feel like you're moving. But if your vestibular system yeah. does it's not moving, if it's not moving, you immediately think you're sick. And it's actually, wow, so total side you note. Know, um, that is actually because of an evolution of humanity where we, like, we feel sick when, uh, like, weird chemicals enter our system that make us feel like nauseous. And so um, our vestibular system gets messed up when we eat like poisons or whatever. So. Um, in order for us to de develop like strong stomachs against poison, we also have this side effect of getting sick when like our vestibular system messes up. Yeah, I heard it was really experienced early on with like, the fighter pilots. They're trying, but yeah. now they, they're seeing it as Yeah, um, there's you. I so it's something that you can kind of overcome. Uh, I I totally have VR legs now, so you know I yeah. use it all the time. It's like, it's like being on the ship. Yeah, I think so. Um, my wife is like the perfect use case for that because she gets sick like instantly. And I, it's hard for me to show her some experience. Any experience that has movement, she will get sick from. So uh, at least I have like a test case that I can use. She's like, oh, I can't do it. Uh, so cool. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. So, uh, so it's like thanks for the presentation. It sounds like it's almost like you know, kind of to be here in Japan was pretty you look around to me on a lot of presentations that show. My question is, uh among those, like what like in Charles kind of just like, you know, just commented from the sensory and what you see over there. Do you guys do anything in terms of like smell? Because oh. that's something I'm like, missing a lot of like the TV screen. You could go to you could think that in VR you like um, Golden Gate Bridge, you can see you are in like camping environments. 
Yeah. But if I'm like, you know, Craig's I feel like it's or something, I'm missing a lot. Yeah. Not all those experiences. Like, is there any plan you guys know? Well, um, I have read about something called, uh, why did it name for Six. Uh, gosh, I don't recall the name of it right now. There is a product that they're working on that can deliver all sorts of different sort of air, aerosol chemicals or something that can, uh, nice. no, I don't, I'm not sure I would want It's called the safe industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is being developed. Um, I don't know if it's like on the consumer market yet. Uh, not by us. We, I would prefer you didn't smell our gym. They actually have already kind of worked on something like that at California Adventures. If you've ever been to Disneyland, there's a yeah. ride Soarin'. called Soren. Yeah. Oh, really? And they, uh, like when you fly over the orange orchard, they'll spray out some sort of orange smell. And wow. um, when you're going over the ocean, they, when you're going through the pine trees, it sprays out kind of like a pine smell. Uh, wow. it's, yeah, that's really cool. I, yeah. It's interesting because we have like three of your senses. We have your vision, your your hearing, and we have haptics, to, like the things that you interact with through the controllers. But yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, taste and smell like a whole new frontier, scary frontier. <laughs> so I've got a question, kind of dev tools. Like, you know, when I first got kids, I'd take pictures and I was taking video and I realized actually doing something with the video was such a pain in the butt. It took so much more effort than pictures. I was like, forget this, I'll just stick with pictures. <laughs> and I, you know, with VR, you, you've got even more you're dealing with. What, you know, how much of a pain is it to really develop this stuff? Um, it's not as hard as you would think. Um, so it depends. So the, as with anything, the base case is pretty easy. So in, in Unity, like I said, you can take the SteamVR plugin, drag it in, and you have the base headset camera working like right out of the gate. Making meaningful interactions is, is much harder. Um, in terms of dev tools, like if you use any kind of game engine, um, they're, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, you know, you're going to interact with geometry and, and you know, all of your texture mapping and animations and things. And, uh, with Unity, I use C Sharp uh, primarily. There is a learning curve for sure, but you know, the, there's resources out there. Of course, that learning curve. Are there? Uh, does it require uh, uh, knowledge or a, a good understanding of uh, various uh, mathematical areas or engineering areas? Well, um, like I said, I, it, it kind of depends on what you want to do. Um, so I would say getting into Unity, if you have never done any sort of software before, it would be a little bit of a challenge. I mean, they, they have the the editor set up that you can make. You know, basic environments and stuff by just dragging things in and positioning them, or whatever. So that aspect of it is not that hard. It's it's getting into like, like I said, meaningful interactions. That's where you know you can really get into some pretty deep math. Uh, for example, one of one of our things uh, at Black Box is we we need to give you a point of interest because there's a lot of stuff happening at the same time in the game, and it's it's pretty overwhelming. So we need to say, okay, now look over here. And how do we make them do that? So we'll, you know, we can take an object and pass it into our class as a as a transformer. <coughs> and let's say my model, I want you to look at my model, but you know the FOV of the headset is like this, so I can't actually see it unless I like look right at it. So, um, so what we do is we take uh, we take the vector from the model to my head, or or vice versa, and we just see does the dot product of that of my facing direction. Uh, equal that. So there's some linear algebra there. Um, we can, uh, yeah, there's, it's really, it's really unlimited what you can do with it. And it, it gets, you know, it's, it's like this in terms of complexity. It's easy to get, start building things, but the more, you know, having a background in math not really helps at all, uh, which I wish I had a lot of. Yeah? Do you have to do uh, the Fourier transforms? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you have to do a lot of Fourier transforms? For your oh, for your for your for your um, I personally haven't had to yet, um, so yeah, that, that's a benefit in my opinion. Um, uh, I'm, you know, we have we have Nick, who's like the big math brain of our company uh, that I work with all the time. And if we had to, uh, he would be the one to do it. Not me. <laughs> yeah. So you were talking earlier in your uh, presentation about uh, doing the exercises. Yeah. So what amount of calibration do you expect your in order to calibrate what your 
your vector saw and everything else. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So, um, so we know the motion pattern that you're supposed to go through already. Um, but what we don't know is about like your body. So um, what we do at the beginning, at the very beginning of the experience, we have a thing that says, look here. We have it kind of like disguised as a retinal scanner, right? Um, and what it actually does is when you're standing up looking at it, it snaps the height of the HMD, and it runs it through an algorithm that we got from NASA that like uh, uh, is like your wingspan. Um, we may go later if we determine through user testing that that's not accurate enough. We might actually have you do this to snap the position. But once we have that, we can sort of build um, the, the apparatus to your actual body. So we have your height. So we, we change the machine, uh, the actual workout machine, like the handles move to the correct height for you. Um, the back pad comes out as far as it needs to come out to support you for doing exercise, whatever it might be. And, um, and we use a machine learning algorithm that, uh, that tracks your previous performance and it sets the weight appropriately too. So as you start out, everybody starts out with a low weight, and you know we each time we see did you pass uh, the you know the ORM that we expected you to? Um, if so, by how much? And how much do we like scale that what we expect out of you from each time? So you you never just like go into the gym and just do a thirty minutes every single time. Uh, this we like maybe next time you'll get thirty one. Or if you did really great, we'll give you 35, or we'll back it down. So you, co you combine both form and weight together. Yeah. 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 And, uh, one, one uh, the last thing I was going to say about that is that it's cool because a lot of people go to the gym and they, you know, really just succeed uh, with, with working out and with pretty much anything is to quantify exactly what you do. And you have to manage your own progression through that. So, like, if I once I'm successful doing the 30s, now I need to move on to the 35s or whatever. Um, but not everyone writes that down. So they just go to the gym, they do what they feel, and they don't really get the results that they expect. So the computer is a bit too bad. Or, so sorry, one more question. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things with working out is it's your plateaus, right? Yeah. You do the same exercise over and over again. You're never going to start getting the same kind of gains. Right. Do you build that into your into yes. mechanisms of Yes, games? we do. So check out this. We have. Uh, um, because the machine, I can control the weight in real time. Like I have a 16 millisecond latency with how fast I can set the weight. So what's cool about that is I can just, if I see that you're like plateauing or whatever, I can now make you have a pyramid set or a drop set. Or like I can even know when you get to the end of your rep and I can jack up the weight for a negative rep. Where like, you know, they, they say that like your eccentric portion is actually the best for muscle growth. So, um, but normally in the gym, you gotta have a partner to like load on the weights when you get to the top. Here I can just do it, I just know you're you're at a certain position. So I can like, you know, work it up like that as well. And as we sort of go forward and develop more exercises, I mean those all have to be tested. So it's there's there's a process that we have to go through to get each each new exercise in. But um, yeah, so yeah, I mean it's it's pretty well thought out. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I tried the HTC drive before and I've noticed that after a little bit of using it, it gets kind of hot. Uh, yeah. The screen is really close to my face, so that light I don't know, kind of makes it hot, and also the adult straps around my head. Um, especially when I'm working out, I also get sweaty and hot. So yeah. How do you manage that? Like, can users you know, work out with every single strap on them? Yeah, so have you can. Uh, it does get sweaty. Uh, but, so we have, um, there's certain uh, like face pads that you can get um, that do enough to absorb the sweat during one workout and so we have like temporary pad things that we put on. Um, we also use, um, so I modded a vibe to use a uh, like a welding mask. Um, so it's plastic, hard plastic. So your sweat doesn't like soak into the band and get all funky. Because one of the, yeah okay, everybody was using it and you know everyone's head gets sweaty in the workout and then the band is just disgusting. And so, oh, I was like, yeah so anyway so I, I made like a hard plastic one. So pretty much I mean it's it's sanitary. It does get a little bit sweaty. Um, we, you know, there's there's been experiments with like putting on some kind of little fan that like blows into the space to keep your face cool. Um, we have that. We haven't really put it in yet, but we're all. One of the things about my job is we're all required to work out in VR at least three times a week. So <laughs> I've done a lot of it, and a, you know, it's it's not a huge problem, but it, it definitely is somewhere that we're you know we're kind of hoping that the headsets will get lighter and cooler. You know, uh, 
for free, you can download an app that'll just superimpose six pack abs on your picture. <laughs> 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 when when uh, mixed reality is in a virtual world and we're wearing consumer devices, yeah. <laughs> they won't need us anymore. It's VR right. That's right. <laughs> so, one thing I had, so this might be kind of a silly question, but so what are you guys doing for, so for VR is great, but if you have glasses, they really get in the way. Sometimes when you're using VR, is there like a way to kind of get around that problem? Yeah, so there, there are prescription lenses that you can get. Um, we haven't really thought about it uh, in terms of our experience yet. But like I said, we're, we're all on the ground floor. We're all just, just building this stuff out. Um, but, so supposedly, I haven't tried it myself, but I've seen people use the visor glasses. It was okay. Um, have you had an experience that was not like that? You know, I, 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 I don't think I have. I haven't had a lot of experience with VR, though. So. Oh, well, yeah. there you go. Prepare yourself <laughs> for an experience beyond your imagination. <laughs> so, cool. yeah. So, I want to make sure we have enough time for the demos as well. So, why don't we take uh, one more question and then go over to, to, to the demos and set a lunch break and for the, the folks here for the training and area meeting, uh, just be back. Uh, here or for the, the, the section uh, meeting uh, up on the third floor by one o'clock. So, uh, yeah. One more. Sure. Actually, how many more questions? <laughs> maybe we can take a couple questions. I know, Tony, you have one, and then maybe one more after that. I, I also brought a ton of business cards, and you guys are more than welcome to email me or whatever. I'm always happy to talk to people. So, yeah. so I have experience using the uh, portability of the headset because the headset you require a computer. Yep. So a lot of time I pick between the teaching applications that actually use an edge happy wear backpack to kind of on them. So that limits the uh, type of activity that they can perform. But also the thing is about the scanner. So those scanner is like it has like a uh, refresh of limits where it actually can limit the frame rate that you can so sometimes if you use a wireless transmission, it can have a delay. It's similar to like the GPU with the monitor, where you need to find a better solution to kind of to match that frame rate. Like and then also certain activities when you play like punch, some of them might block that you actually need to have an indoor positional which is uh, positioning technology to kind of help what happens if the tracking is not working. Yeah, that's a really good question. So tracking has been one of our major challenges. Um, so for your for the, kind of the first part, um, we tried uh, experimenting with TPCast and sort of the the, 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 you know, the first wireless solutions. We kind of got a pre-order of that. And you're right, it, it, it did not help that we were trying to transmit so much data over that bank, and it couldn't keep up with what we were trying to do. Um, so we still have a wired solution. But what we have is a Wrangler that like comes over the top of our gym, uh, our, our uh, resistance machine, and and so the wire like comes straight down and it's and it's like flexible and so you can kind of like you can squat down, you can do jumps and whatever. And there is still a wire, but it's kind of going straight up. Um, so we connect to a high end PC that's like in the back of the machine. Uh, for so for tracking. It's, it can be a real challenge. Um, one of the things is, uh, I was fortunate enough last year at, I think, GBC, I met um, one of the electrical engineers that uh, designed the wire. And he told us uh, something that they worked on that we couldn't find anywhere online. But essentially, one of the major causes of tracking loss is actually EM interference. Um, and because your, your USB cable is super long and it's like, you know, it's absorbing all that radiation. So, like, it is. Um, take a big ferrite horse and you, you take one of the bike cables and you wrap the entire thing mm. around it so you have this big EM blocker. And that actually worked really well for us. Um, we do still have the problem of occlusion so a lot of times like doing these exercises uh, you know the, the lighthouse might not be able to see like one of my arms or whatever so you can get tracking loss like that. Uh, so Early 2018, and hopefully before the end of the year, because uh, we're on Valve's uh, preferred developer list, we get a lot of the pre-release hardware. SteamVR 2.0, um, 
uses a system that's not limited to only two base stations, so we can have a one all over the place. And so to limit occlusion, uh, we can make our track devices smaller. So we'll work on <laughs> Yeah. One last question. Okay, follow up on that. I thought that one of the things that was fixing that was also going to a bare minimum of the amount of gate you actually have to transfer to actually follow where you're in dimensional space. Like from an optimization standpoint, well, I was, the data that's coming in from the Vive, I think, is pretty much set, uh, as far as I understand. Like, so um, there, there's a minimum of data that needs to be transferred, which is your like rotational, uh, you know, accelerometer data and position data from the lighthouses and that kind of thing. Um, other than that, we don't really transmit along that channel anything else. But other than that, um, I. I don't know if they use any sort of like compression uh, of that data or whatever, but that would be awesome. Um, I know they're still working on it. Um, I'm really excited for CBR 2.0 though. It's going to like better tracking and behavior for us. So. Okay, um, I need a couple minutes to set this all up. So. Uh,